Ironside will not be seen tonight, so we may bring you the following special program. Word Balloon is brought to you by the League of Word Balloon Listeners. Do you really want to, do you really want to take it? Welcome back, everybody. Time again for Word Balloon, the comic book conversation show. John Suntress here. I was telling him this backstage. Uh, this is really a treat for me because, really, I've been a fan for this guy. God, not to ages, Sean, but like at least 20 years, if not more. Sean Martinborough, welcome to Word Balloon. Thanks for having me, John. Thanks. But although I have to say, you know, you're having me follow an amazing commercial featuring Alex Ross artwork. And and how can I follow that Mohegan Sun uh a commercial. I mean, really? I mean, come on, that, that's ridiculous. Come on, you got me following these two things. I know. I'm sorry, man. I, they're sponsors. What can I tell you? I mean, but, uh, it's fun. I mean, I really, I feel like doing like the whole peacemaker dance while I'm sitting here waiting. <laughs> but uh, no, dude, you're as you know, you're no slouch, and I and I was so excited to talk to you. Uh, really, I, you know, like, uh, well, you know, I think maybe our age group might be the last one that loved comics as a kid then checked out for a while when we were trying to get dates and, you know, kind of living our life in our twenties. And in the very, uh, like 99, 2000, first I was aware of Ruck, Greg Rucka because of no man's land, the novelization mm. of that, that run at uh, DC. And then I started reading detective with you and Greg. And I swear, man, your guys run knocked me out. Now this is black and white and wow. a great shot, a great splash page. But, uh, I, uh, I, I, and I, I will purposely almost grab some uh, black and white images to kind of highlight just your, your, your style. And it, it's just so great. And it was so like, 
um, unconventional, at least to my eye, uh, mm -hmm. than, you know, really even Alex, who has a more traditional style and stuff. But it's like, um, did Dave Stewart color your guys' stuff? God, I'm trying to remember back. Sorry, man. <laughs> no, no, yeah, because we're talking, we're talking what, 20, 23 years ago? Yeah, about 20, yeah. 20, going on 25 years ago. But I'm trying to remember who did color that. I don't think, for some reason, I don't think it was a person. I think it was like a studio. Oh, yes. You might be, was it maybe Comic Craft or somebody like that? Um, yeah. I, I don't, not, not, I don't think it was Comic Craft, but I, for some reason, I remember a studio name in the credits. Although, if I'm totally blanking out on the colorist, please forgive me. But I think it might have been a studio that colored us. Colored, well, colored regardless, um, the palette they used, and again, your style, uh, it absolutely fit Batman. But I just wasn't used to that. Because, well, even if I may, Sean, what, did you have any specific bad influences when you were uh, doing Detective? Bat uh, influences? Well, I mean, yeah, artist wise, yeah. Um, listen, I mean, I grew up with. I'm trying to think back then. I mean, I I love Norm Gray, Gray Fogel, Neil Adams, Frank Miller. Um, what? Well, Jim Aparo did some stuff, and sure. Marshall. What was it? Marshall. Marshall Rogers. Yeah. Marshall Rogers. Yeah, like those. I I grew up reading those that steady stream of Batman books, you know, and I would kind of bounce around here and there. I don't think I ever bought Batman continuously the way I would buy Marvel books, you know. Okay. Um, but yeah, but but I definitely think the Frank Miller. Oh, and the David Mazzucchelli. Forget about David David Of course, I sure. That. Um, yeah, but but and also, I really was discovering Alex Toth probably back then. So Alex Toth was a huge, a huge influence because actually it's funny because. Before I got the Batman gig, I well, I started my career painting for Marvel. Uh, I was I was doing fully full color paintings. That's what they called the process back then. And you know, after Alex Ross blew up doing his series of Marvel books, then Marvel was like, "Hey, let's get a bunch of other guys to do painted books." And I was one of like the, the first wave of guys that they, that they hired to do painted books. Wow. Um, and that was where I got my starting comics. But then um i knew the milestone guys and um the milestone so so what would what i would do is because at the time i was a student at the school of visual arts <clears throat> and excuse me for those of you who don't know the geography of manhattan the school of visual arts was on 23rd street uh marvel was like on 27th street uh and milestone was on 21st street so i would kind of like when i would i would go to class then go to Marvel, drop off work, and then I would go to Milestone and hang out. And the reason why I bring up Milestone is that that's where I met John Paul Leon, the the great late you know uh, you know John Paul Leon, um, who unfortunately passed away about what about maybe two years ago now. That's right. But yeah. um, yeah, he and I started working together on Static, and we both discovered Alex Toth at the same time. And that's my big roundabout way of saying how I was into Alex Toth, and then once. You know, but we worked together for years where I was inking John and he was penciling static and we worked together for years on projects. And then when, you know, he wanted to I, I wanted to get back to drawing. He wanted to he play with Inky himself and work with other inkers. That's when I got the Batman gig. And then I probably brought a lot of the Alex Toth influence to that that job. OK, and I absolutely I see the Toth influence. I was even going to say. Almost a uh, modern twist on um, Dick Sprang because oh, you had okay. this cartoony style. But absolutely no, again, and and you'll forgive me. This is the kind of the lone bad man image, but I definitely see the Toth influence uh, now that yeah. you say it. Um, that's great, and shame on me, man. I didn't realize you were working at uh, both, uh, you know, Marvel and Milestone, and that's great. Johnny was John was a really really good guy, and yeah. Uh, you know, yeah, it's a, it's it's a massive loss. In fact, Joe Dougherty, uh, in fact, uh, acknowledges indeed. Um, oh. Yeah, that's rough, man. Um, yeah, he was. I mean, he was an amazingly talented guy and like the nicest, the nicest person, the most humble. Considering how amazingly talented he was, you know, it was just amazing how humble and how down earth he was. And I actually still have all of our original pages for that. I'm wow. Wondering. Yeah. Jeez. You know. Yeah. You're surrounded. I'm even going to zoom in on you. Because you're surrounded with by so much great artwork right there. Don't zoom in too close. That stuff hasn't been printed yet. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, yeah. Actually, that's no part of my process. Like so usually, like because my art table is here, and usually when I'm drawing, I'll because I'm old school, I draw by hand. 
Wow. So usually, so usually when I'm when I draw a board, finish drawing a page of artwork, I'll take it in the next room, scan into Photoshop, do a couple of tweaks, and then create a digital file. And that's what you pretty much send to the, the, the publishers these days. And then when I'm done, I put the originals up on this board so I can kind of keep track of continuity as I'm going. And inevitably, I'll say like, oh, crap, that's an elbow that's wrong. And I'll pull <laughs> a page down, and I'll probably tweak it, rescan it, and then I'll put it back up there. But that's also how I kind of keep track of continuity. So, but... Getting back to the John Paul Leon stuff, yeah, like I really wish that I could go back. I really wish I had taken more photographs back during those days. Like today, I, I take photos all the time with my camera, and people that follow me on social media can see I'm always posting photographs. But back in those days, I have such fond memories of John Paul. Whenever we would finish an issue uh, for, for for civilians out there, when you split the art chores up between the penciler and the inker. Uh, they get to divide up the artwork. And I think the inker gets maybe a third of the of the original art and the penciler gets two thirds. And John and I would sit there at my at the milestone offices after hours and it was like we were trading baseball cards. And we would kind of negotiate who gets what page. So I'm like, <laughs> can I get that page? It's like, oh, I like that page. And I'd say, all right, how about I give you this page for that page? And so that's how I pretty much got like my great stack of original artwork. And I've just... I've always kept it. I've never sold it. So I have like a, a ton of, you know, all of my uh, original John Paul Leon artwork is is here. Yeah. That's really cool. Uh, Dayton Ellis or Dayton Willis or Wills mm -hmm. is watching and said he subscribed. I really appreciate it, Dayton. I was like when new people pop in, I'm assuming that you're here because you're a fan of Sean says I am. Uh, that's really cool. What Marvel books were you working on uh, back then? So I got my start. um working for the epic line so back yeah. in the day marvel had this they had an epic line that was their more kind of adult line of books and i i got my first professional work painting so i was doing at the time epic had the hellraiser line of books and they were putting out a series of like hellraiser like one shots mini series everything was hellraiser and and so i got hired for my first job to do a uh illustration for one of the hellraiser books and that led to another illustration. And then I did a, a six page story. And then um, my editor, Marcus McLaurin, shout out to Marcus, because Marcus McLaurin gave me my first job in, in comics because he was a Marvel editor and he was editing the, the epic line. He offered me a painted book. Uh, like I said, Marvel had had so much success with the Alex Ross painted books that they were just saying, OK, what other painted books can we put out? And so at the time, Marcus gave me a choice. He said, you know, you could do, uh, uh, I have a script from Peter David, or and I have a script from Mike Barron. You choose. Now, in hindsight, you know, I, I really should have done the Peter David, because Peter David was hot back, back in those days. But I was such a huge Nexus fan. And Mike Barron is the co-creator, him and Steve Root. I loved... During college, I would go find back issues of Nexus. I loved that book so much. I'm like, to be able to work with Mike Barron, I got to do the Mike Barron story. So it was called Tales of the Blockbusters. It was a spinoff of um, a John Byrne Fantastic Four issue where for the, now I'm going to get really, really in the weeds with the fans here. So <laughs> it was during a John Byrne Fantastic Four, like when Terax, one of Galactus's heralds, was uh, wreaking havoc. And he ended up, you know, like he was fighting the Fantastic Four and there was some collateral damage. And this story that Mike Barron wrote was basically following a group of people that were in one of these buildings that were destroyed um, during this big Terax battle. And it kind of followed like these people. And it was like a slice of life story um, with some touches of super superhero stuff. But yeah, that was like my first really big project for Marvel, you know. Well, it sounds like you were working around the time of the speculation implosion. Were you bit in the ass by any of that? No, no. See, I, I got my first job in comics in 1992. Okay. So okay. you're talking about what, the image bubble? Like the whole... Well, just comics in general and really even Marvel's kind of middling period in the, in the you know, into the late 90s where even they were facing bankruptcy and stuff. I don't know. See, I at that point, what happened was is that after I had done my painted work for Marvel, I was kind of overlapping... Uh, doing the painted work for Marvel and then inking uh, John Paul at Milestone. So we were working on Static and then they moved us from Static to the Shadow Cabinet. <clears throat> and then 
John started getting offered like gigs from Marvel. So we did like Cyclops, the further adventures of Cyclops and Phoenix. We did like a Logan one shot. And then DC was like, hey, we want to throw more work at you guys. And so we started doing the challenges of, of the unknown, which, you know. Was that with was, Jeff? With Jeff Loeb? No, that was pre-Jeff Loeb. Yeah, okay. that was pre-Jeff Loeb. This was written by uh, Stephen Grant, Len Kaminsky. And they had yeah. a really fresh take, which seriously, like um, um, James Gunn, you should really reboot their challenges of the unknown. Because if anybody does a Google for the uh, challenges of the unknown that was drawn by John Paul and inked by myself, it was the characters that John designed were so amazing. They looked so cool. And so we worked on that for a number of years. And so I was at D.C., for a, I was really at DC when all that bubble stuff happened. When Image really happened, I was really on the cusp of just kind of like working. I, and at the same, at the time, I really wished I could have just sort of, I don't know, I, I missed the bubble. Okay. I, I missed the Good. bubble by like a, by some time. So you know, yeah. But I, I wasn't I wasn't caught up in it. But yeah, because at the time, and I was at, I think I was pretty much entrenched over at DC. You know. So did Danny O'Neill put you and Greg together for Detective? Okay, so what happened was, is that, um, <clears throat> so I I had a friend, Joe Illich. Uh, I know Joe. Is, yeah. Joe's, he's, you know, comics, been in the comics forever. And yeah. Joe, you know, we, we were friends, and he basically suggested me to work on a Batman project. Because before that, I had been working, I had been, I drew The Creeper. I did the Creeper series for DC, <laughs> which was, oh, that was so amazing. I was inked by Sal Bashema, which was crazy. I'm like, Sal's inked. Wow. Me. Yeah. And and that was, I mean, Sal was like the greatest guy. And shout out to Sal Bashema because I was a huge fan of him, you know, growing up reading comics. And to have Sal inking me was just crazy. So we worked on the Creeper um, for like a, a stretch. And that's when Joe suggested me for a one shot. Uh, for the bad office and it was a christopher priest story called batman the hill great um shout out to christopher priest yeah so, I, so christopher priest i guess had pitched like a 13 issue maxi series it's some crazy it was like maybe eight or 10 issue maxi series at the last minute dc cut that to like a 40 page one shot which i can't even imagine how brutal that could be and so joe suggested me for that that hill one shot and then based on that, uh, they were looking, it was around the time where they were looking to shake up their creative teams. And they said, okay, well, we like what Sean did on the Hill. And I think Joe suggested me to Denny O'Neill and Mark Chiarello. And they said, okay, cool. And that's how I got Detective Comics. So, you know, and that, and that's really, that, that's, that's how I got that gig. And working with Greg Rucka was great. And shout out to Greg, because Greg's a, such a great guy. A mensch. Absolutely no, he's he's one of my uh, best friends in, as far as comic creators go. And, oh, and, and wait, I have to shout out to Mark Chiarello because you know what? And, and of Denny, course, shout out to Danny O'Neill too. <laughs> but Mark Chiarello, I was a fan of Mark because rewind back when I was doing the painted work for the Hellraiser series, Mark had done uh, like a short story, a painted short story. Oh wow, for Hellraiser, yeah. And I huge, I was a huge fan of Mark's work, and so. To go from sort of being a fan and then working sort of under him, I guess, at DC Comics was just awesome. That was just another like pinch me kind of moment. Mark is a great. Uh, I, I love the solo series that he curated, mm. and uh, didn't he do um, either old uh, baseball players in general? Did he do a Negro League? Yes, yes. Yeah. So I got the, I got the Jackie Robinson here, and then and and that's that's that's, that's a great that's a great um, point. Yeah, to anybody who doesn't know. Mark Chirillo did an amazing book. It's actually in the other room of talking about old, famous, legendary baseball players. Uh, and I think it was like a focus on the Negro League baseball so. players, yeah. which just just beautiful. Like I, I keep saying that if I had more wall space, I would hit Mark up and say, Mark, can I please get a high res version of one of those prints so I can print it out and frame it and put it on the wall? But I have no wall space. So Yes, clearly. I had <laughs> yeah, I understand. Yeah. You know, I spent 20 years in, in sports radio here in Chicago, and I always say I have no desire to go back to the day-to-day -day sports stuff, but the one thing I would do if given the opportunity is sports documentaries. Uh, and I'm such a, a you know fan of, of baseball, including the Negro Leagues and Chicago Americans, and, you know, uh, I'm a big boxing guy as well. 
You so. see, I'm, I am not a sports guy by any stretch of the imagination. When I was a kid, I used to collect baseball cards, football cards, and then I just sort of lost interest. And so now I could care less, but I have friends that will have like, they'll, they'll invite me to games like a Nats, like, cause I'm down in DC. So they'll yeah. invite me to like a Nats game or a Wizards game. And I'll be like, okay, cool. Like I'll, It'll, it'll be a break from leaving the art table. I'll go there, but I could care less. And my sister's always like, Sean, you don't even care about basketball, but yet you're sitting on the court side. You know what I mean? Like, you don't even care about this. But I'm like, hey, whatever. So, you know. I hear you, Matt. You know, uh, in my sports days, uh, the first, I believe, Nationals manager, Frank Robinson, you know, he was working up uh, in the league office. And when the league bought um, the Nationals from the Montreal Expos and turned them into the Nationals, they needed a manager fast and they made uh, Frank come back down and be in the dugout and, and manage that team. And he, wow. when he would come through Chicago, we loved Frank and me wow. and my hosts would uh, ESPN classic used to show this old black and white uh, show from the sixties called home run derby. And of course mm -hmm. they still do the tournament at the all-star game, but it was like a game show and it was always, you know, top players. And uh, we're like, Frank, we still watch the reruns of, uh, of home run derby. He's like, Home run derby because you should be even watching Judge Judy before you watch me on one of those <laughs> old reruns. We were dying. He was so yeah. great. So oh, that's man. that's my small uh, Washington Nationals uh, collection. <laughs> See, you Zab says it loves you. Loved your work with Ruck on Detective. How long were you on Detective? I was only on. I was on Detective for maybe like about a year or two. Yeah, maybe about a year or two. Uh, and then, yeah, because they did like another shakeup, and so. Steve Lieber followed me on Detective. Okay, yeah. Shout out to Steve Lieber. And then, yeah, and then I bounced over to Marvel. And that kind of started my time working for Marvel for a bit. And what heroes did you work on then at uh, Marvel? So um, uh, an editor, Mark Powers, was over at Marvel. He reached out to me and said, hey, Sean, you know, uh, would you be interested in drawing a miniseries about the Morlocks? which is uh, a spinoff from the X-Men. And I'm like, sure. He's like, okay, but these are the Morlocks that you know. These are original mutants. Um, and this is going to be set in Chicago. Oh, and wow. it's, it's by this like new writer. His name is Jeff Johns. And yeah, I'm like, sure. <laughs> sure cool. And yeah, and that was, that was, you know, I think that might've been like Jeff's either first or second gig in comics. Um, and it was like a four issue. I think it was four or five issues. No one bought it. You know, it just kind of like it was really kind of like a, you know, it, it came and went. But it was fun. Like, I really had fun drawing the characters. And and uh, yeah, that's that was that. I think I think that was the only thing I did for Marvel. And then I kind of started doing a lot of commercial illustration work, like storyboards, working, doing book covers. Um, oh, and, I, and actually, that was a period where I really wanted to um, get into film. Because, you know, that's because that to me, I've always been a film and television buff. And so I really started working with with uh, two buddies and we put together a production company and we actually started shooting independent films that we got into a couple of film festivals. And that was really great. So that was kind of like a detour away from comics, but I was still storytelling. You know, I kind of wondered and assumed you might have gone into uh, book covers and things like that. And it doesn't surprise me. Uh, that you did get into um, film proper and stuff. Wow. Um, can we find your films? Are they streaming this, anywhere? No, because this is all pre... We're talking about maybe 2002, oh, three, four. Really, it was, it was probably like the stretch between 2003 and 2006 where we were shooting these. And this is pre-internet. So pre-internet, and this is pre-high def. So we were still, you know, if you were shooting independent, you usually were shooting on film or you would shoot on video and you would try to push it to like to get a film look. But yeah. I tell you, John, like that was some like the, the, the most fun I've ever had as a storyteller, because it's one thing as an artist where you get a script and you have to draw it out. But to be able to go to a location and kind of find the angles and then work with actors that, you know, that, that you can kind of find the frame. And I used to always see people going like this and I'm like, what is that? But it actually works. It actually really does help when you go to a location and you do this. And this is actually, you know what, this is like right after, now that I think about this, this was 2001 or 2002 wow. because it was right after 9-11 happened. And we, you know, at that time, this is in New York City. So New York City was like the, the police military presence was super heavy. 
And typically you need permits to shoot in New York anyway, but we were going the independent route. So we, there was like no money for permits, but I remember that we had a really great scene that we were going to shoot in Grand Central, right? And at the time you literally had military guys in Grand Central just for security purposes. And I remember we had our actors outside, we had storyboarded out the scene and we made a plan outside of Grand Central. Okay, you guys go here, we'll give you the signal. We'll be up on the balcony here with the camera. And it was, we, we just did it. We stole all of these shots in Grand Central. And it was amazing. It was, it was really, it was, a, it was a great project too because it was like a sci-fi X-Files type project that we ended up pitching to studios, but we were, it was too high concept because if you can imagine, we were pitching like people with superpowers, X-Files, and it, this is like pre-X-Men, pre, you know, this is like, it's just, it was so high concept and the, the studios, the television studios, were like still doing lawyer cop doctor shows. And I remember yeah. we actually we actually pitched NBC. We were sitting in the NBC offices in LA and we were pitching this and they were like, you know, that's good. It's just it's too high concept. Wow. Too yeah, you know, I don't know if you're watching this on the CW, but there's this great series, 1982, greatest mm -hmm. geek year ever. No, and no. it focuses on that year. And you know, there's Poltergeist, there's E.T., there's Star Trek II, there's Rocky III, um, Night Shift, uh, Ron Howard and Henry oh. Winkler, and Dean Devlin, creator mm -hmm. of Stargate and a bunch, yeah. bunch of other great stuff. It's mm -hmm. interesting because it's almost a common as well on the studios today because Dean's like, you know, I have, and he's talking about modern times. He's like, I've got a great idea. I shopped it around to all the studios. And that guy's got a track record. And obviously, his you know, Independence Day and everything. And yeah. um they all heard him out and they're like, this is great. We'd never make this. Every studio said the same thing. And he's like, why not? And they're like, well, it's not based on anything. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that's, you know, so yeah, high concept, unfortunately, still a mystery 20 years later for these uh, studios. They don't want to take the risk. And I understand, well, you know, Luke Besson and Valerian, very high concept sci-fi. I mean, I still haven't seen it because they're dead and that's so great. And I know they spent a lot of money on it. And again, Luke Besson, for God's sake, you know. Well, you know, one of the things that, that we learned, because we didn't, we, we had, my partners and I, we had meetings, like a lot of high profile meetings with studios. I, I think we, we met with Sci-Fi, we met with NBC, we met with like really big studios and we didn't, everybody passed on what we were, what we were pitching, but we learned so much information just from that experience of going there and seeing how they listen to things and how they, how, how they evaluate. And like you said, here's the thing, you know. I see both sides of this. People are always like, oh, why do they keep making the same shit over and over? Well, because people tend to go see the same shit over and over. And if you think about this, think about that you're a Hollywood executive and there are 50 million people that want to get your job. They will slit your throat for your parking space. So do you take a risk on something brand new like The Matrix? Or do you say, hey, let's, let's, let's remake The Biotic Man because at least somebody's going to show up. At least somebody says, oh, I know what that is. And if it bombs, you can always blame it on the director. Hey, he screwed up the adaptation. If you're going to base something on a comic book or a book, there's plausible deniability. Hey, the book was popular. Right. They, they screwed it up in the translation. So I get to save my job. And so, you know, I, I, I get it. But it was a really interesting process, though, just, just pitching something, you know, putting it into film festivals. And that was really great because we went to film festivals and to see people in a theater watching your work is just amazing. So yeah, that was a really great detour that I did from like, you know, comics for a couple of years. You know, this is such a weird year. Of course we have the SAG and the uh, WGA strikes going on, but mm -hmm. also the underperformance of Indiana Jones. I mean, we're coming off a weekend where Barbie and Oppenheimer had a, had a really great weekend, but yeah. kind of outliers compared to, in in this post COVID world, any any thoughts as a, as a guy that's you know kind of been part of this world? What's happening right now? And what what you think is happening? You know, oh, listen, I mean, I, I'm no I'm no soothsayer, but I think that people are getting smarter. I think or not not even smarter. Audiences are becoming more discerning, and I think coming out of the pandemic, where you know, listen, you're kind of locked in your house, you get to like look at everything at the at your fingertips. They're like, I'm not going to go out and leave the house and spend money on anything. 
And so, like, and I'm a big movie buff, so I usually go see things the opening weekend. So I saw Barbie first, and then, I, no, I saw Oppenheimer first, and then I went to go see Barbie. And I knew, first of all, I knew that both of those were going to make crazy money, you know, and they were both very smart movies. I thought they were really good. But it's interesting because I went to see Indiana Jones, and I was just like, you know what? This didn't need to be made, to be honest. And I love Indiana Jones. But for me, what was really weird about that movie is that it's almost like they undid the happy ending that Indy had at the end of four to redo it and give him another happy ending at the end of five. Cause I'm like, wait a minute. He, he ended off on a good note with Marion. Like they, they were together, they were good. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, like, you know, you, you introduce this tragedy and then all this other stuff. And I'm just kind of like, yeah, it, it just, it just didn't need, it wasn't necessary. And I think that, and I'm a huge, I used to love the fast and the furious franchise. I used to defend that franchise to the death. But after the last two movies, I got to stop because it got ridiculous after a point. And the last one is, I'm just like, guys, you're really insulting my intelligence here. <laughs> so I can understand people saying, you know what? We've had enough of that. We're not going to go see it. But you look at something like Into the Spider-Verse, which is completely new. It's just new. You know what I mean? And I, you know, I've been so busy. I meant to go back and see that a second time because the first time was just really just like, a huge adrenaline dose of creativity that you literally can't take in everything that you see on that screen, you know? And for me as, a, as an artist and as a storyteller, I'm studying like things in like the corner of the frame, you know, like I, sometimes I'm, I'm not even paying attention to the dialogue because I'm just looking at the visuals, you know what I mean? So I, but there was so much in that movie that I'm like, wow, like that's just an experience. You know what I mean? I think that's what people are looking for when they go to the movies. So, you know, Barbie was an experience. Oppenheimer was an experience. You know what I mean? Into the yes. Spider-Verse was an experience. Even Mission Impossible. And I love those Mission Impossible movies. It's an experience. Okay. That's cool. I And I was glad to hear that Cruz kind of insisted on, a, on an ending, even though it's part one. And that's yeah. what made me gun shy about not seeing it yet. Um, but so that is good to hear. And, and also, Sean, yeah. go ahead. No, no, I was going to say, like, that was really interesting because that movie, it, it is part one, but it feels like a complete story which is something that I think a lot of movies have been trying to do with these cliffhangers. Like literally Fast and Furious, they just they just said, okay, listen, we're just ending this right now. <laughs> like, it's just like, wait, the movie's just, it's just stopping right there. That's it. But this really felt like, okay, you know what? I get it that this is part one, but it really felt complete. So I thought that was a pretty interesting, really, that was really good storytelling. Did you see The Flash? Yes. <laughs> All right. I, I I gave it a C at best. You know, even before his personal pro their personal problems, excuse me. Yeah. I've never liked Ezra Miller as Barry Allen, and I don't agree with the way they wrote Barry Allen. He's there to be comic relief. And I I felt that uh Ezra Miller wasn't that funny, wasn't that charismatic. And to have two versions of Barry Allen in The Flash, it's like, well, that's double of kind of what I don't like. I really came from Michael Keaton. Yeah. And and he didn't he didn't disappoint. I liked his role, and I was glad it was more than just a cameo. But still, it wasn't enough for me to really like the movie. Well, the thing with the Flash for me is that, and I watched maybe like the first six seasons of the Flash, but you've had like nine seasons of this character now, right? So the fans have seen this character before. Now, for people that haven't seen that TV show. This character isn't that interesting to me. I just found like the character was that interesting on the on the big screen, and yeah, and you know, and I don't the whole Ezra Miller, you know, goofy character, goofy Flash thing, you know, it's it kind of works when kind of works it when he was with the Justice League and he had all these other characters. And actually, I like that original design of his costume, even though I'm, I'm the only person that did like it. I have the, the figure, <laughs> um, but but I never liked the way they visualized him. I never liked the way he runs, like he kind of flops around. I just, aesthetically, I just don't like that approach no. from a visual standpoint. You know, for me, I'm like, can someone just design a Flash to move, like, think about, like, Thundercats. The opening, which has one of the best openings in, like, cartoon history. 
<laughs> when I forget the, the 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 female the woman character's name, she's like running like super animation style. Like that's what I want to see with the Flash. I just want to see him moving really fast. But to see him flopping around like that, I just didn't like that. And just like you said, the goofiness. It was like two two. It was like goofiness times two. And the second version was actually goof, so goofy that he made the original version seem kind of normal. Absolutely. And then I just I just didn't care about the story. Like the story was just boring. And the thing is, I love that director. I thought that Andy. Um, which Bichetti, or I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing his last name right. I love what he did with the It movies. I thought yes. the It movies were great. Yes. But this, I just felt that I just didn't like the storytelling choices that they chose for that, like the babies and the microwave. Yeah, and I'm that like, was weird. I was like, are they doing like a goof on that Kyle Baker thing with the baby in the microwave? Because remember, Kyle Baker did that infamous, you know, joke that DC pulled. Because, like, where else have you seen someone sticking babies in microwaves? I'm like, That's are they doing that and that? And it was just <laughs> weird. I, I just, yeah, it just didn't really work. But I did like Michael Michael Keaton was cool. And I liked the Supergirl. Supergirl was really cool. Yeah. Yeah. But I wish there really was more of her. You know, yeah, she really didn't have much to do. Yeah. yeah. No, I'm, I'm with you on all that. And people complained about the CGI at the end when he's in the Speed Force and we got all that know. stuff. It didn't bother me. And also, I mean, I did feel like, I wish that they uh, zoomed in a little. I mean, George Reeves in the 1950s film, that's a challenge. Uh, and maybe it is too for 60s uh, Bruce or Adam West. But I wish they had gotten a little closer on Adam West. I liked Nick Cage's little cameo. That was cute. Knowing, you know, you know. All, that, all that stuff at some point just to me seemed like real fan service. I'm like, do we need, is this relevant to the story? Is it is yeah. it relevant to the story or are you just throwing us like a bunch of, visual goodies and i'm like at that point i was just like okay you know what yeah you know what and i did i did laugh out, i did laugh out laugh out loud at the end joke with the bat with the, the who popped up as batman like that was kind of funny oh yeah Clooney. yeah, yeah we could yeah, well, that, sorry that was funny <laughs> but i just yeah overall i just thought that yeah like we you don't you haven't brought anything new to this character the flash no and he shouldn't be goofy like that you shouldn't you shouldn't make him goofy so well and you know i love jeff's jeff johns's original flashpoint event in the comics mm -hmm. but i have to say too and and really jeff's jeff's a good friend but um barry allen didn't need the mom dying tragedy that yeah. i think jeff kind of imprinted on uh barry in the comics and it's like you know whatever i i like the idea that the irony that the world's fastest man is always late when it comes to a civilian you know thing i mean mm -hmm. and really i mean you know too us growing up you know I uh, uh, Dan, Dan Slott made the comment that a lot of the Justice League could uh, be in a bus and suddenly they're going through a tunnel and all we see are the word balloons and you'd have no idea who was talking if mm. it was the, the Silver Age or the Bronze Age because mm. they really didn't have personalities per se. But I was yeah. like Barry is kind of a working uh, police scientist, detective, and I like when he does uh, interact with Batman and on that kind of investigative science level – Barry can you know hold his own with Batman yeah. even, and I and I appreciated that. But you know, yeah, I don't know. I mean, you know, what are your thoughts maybe as Barry as a a good example of Barry as a character? I don't know. Yeah, I don't. I, I really you got to. I, I gotta shout out to Jeff because you know Jeff's a, a friend, and I just I never read any of that Flashpoint stuff. Those I've never okay. read, any of that, but everyone praises it, so it's just I'm. It's on my stack. Of one day I'll get to that, but <laughs> I, I don't know. Just, I think that if you're gonna the thing about these movies, I think the problem with DC is that, and, and clearly they got a number of problems, but with the with the film yeah. stuff, you got to find a way in that's going to make Barry Allen. If you're going to, let's take The Flash, for example, you got to make it, find a way to make him interesting to your average person. You know what I mean? The, the, to the average person. And yeah, and I just thought that it was just kind of boring as a character. I'm just like, yeah, I don't really care. He's annoying. And I'm, you're, building, you're basing a whole franchise on this. So, yeah. I'm with you. Well, you know, and again, I, I'm glad you're talking about uh, visuals and storytelling, and I'm intrigued. I am not an artist, but I have always been such a fan of your work. How how long ago did this book come out? The art, exactly. Here, well, no, no. I, I just want to be able to do it because I can see I could do that. So it's kind of like, what, what was that movie with someone like this? Was that Superman? No, no, Batman. It was Batman. Um, so now I'm getting all, all really geeky with you when when the Joker <laughs> went like that in like the first Batman movie when, you know, <laughs> they had like the smile thing. Yeah. Sure. Anyway. Okay. Um, Let's talk about how to draw noir comics. Absolutely, man. You know, actually, this is part of that detour 
that I did when I sort of left comics for a little bit. And um, actually, Joe Illich had suggested, because we had a friend who was working at Watson Guptill, which was a, a publishing company, and they put out a lot of how-to books. And uh, shout out to Jackie Ching, because Jackie is a former Milestone person. She was working over there. And, um, you know, Joe was like, hey, you know, you ought to do like a how-to book. And I'm like, that's a very good idea. That's a, that's a very good idea. So, but I didn't want to do a typical how-to book, like where you show should teach people how to draw legs and arms and elbows. I figured, let me kind of approach this in a way where you, I'm really teaching people about how I storytell, how I tell a story visually and what my thought process is and how, and how I, you know, develop my craft and how I started drawing from early age. And so, yeah, I put that together and I pitched it to Jackie and Jackie was like, Hey, I love it. Let's do it. And, and that actually was a really great move because that book has opened up. It's introduced me to so many people beyond comics, you know, because that's a book on the book stands. And, you know, I, I have people around the world that are still buying that book. You know, it's still, it does, it still sells pretty, pretty well, you know what I mean? And, you know, it's been reprinted in, in uh, Korean and um, just, wow. it's, I'm really, yeah, I'm really proud of it. So they keep asking me if I'm going to do a second one. I'm like, yeah, I just, I just have to find the time to, to do it. You know? I understand. And I, um, I'm glad I don't, shame on me. I don't have the cover, uh, uh, a cover. I noticed on your website uh, that you were showing a, uh, a foreign language, maybe it was French of uh, Thief of Thieves. Yeah, it was Korean. It was Korean. Oh, it's Korean. Korean. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Yeah. All right. Very different. <laughs> but, but, uh, man, I love that series. And I was really glad. Um, how did, how did, did Kirkman approach you for that? I, how did you guys get together to do that? Because Robert wrote that, right? Well, for, for what? Thief of Thieves? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thief of Thieves. So, yeah. So at that point, like I'd been doing work for Marvel and then out of the blue, Kirkman, Robert Kirkman shot me an email and said, Hey, I'm a big fan. I'd love to work with you on a project. It doesn't involve zombies. Uh, so I said, oh, okay. You know, and, <laughs> and so you're talking about maybe 2009, maybe 2009-ish, yeah. I think. Yeah, yeah. And um, I hadn't read The Walking Dead. I, I you know, because at that point he was really, The Walking Dead comic book was huge. And um, I think he had just made the deal for the TV show. But I knew Robert because he had done this really infamous, well, this very viral YouTube video where he was just railing against mainstream comics and how independent comic books were going to be the future. And I was like, the guy's got points. He's got points. So that's where I knew Robert from. And so in the but and on the side, people were like, oh, The Walking Dead, it's so great, it's so great. And so I said, sure, let's 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 team up. Let's do this Thief of Thieves thing. And this was like right before the New York Comic Con. And I think it was maybe about a couple months before the Walking Dead show debuted. And uh, he's like, yeah, you want to come to New York Comic Con and we can meet. And, and I go by his booth and like, they have like all of these stacks of Walking Dead hardcovers, like $39.99 flying off the shelves, like boom, 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 like boom, flying. I'm like, damn, okay, this is, this is a good move right here. This is a good move. And uh, yeah, then the Walking Dead TV show came out and boom, it was off the races. And then we, we put out Thief of Thieves and, you know, initially that was like he had set that up at AMC to, to go like to be a series. But then that just yeah. got caught, that got caught up in a lot of kind of like red tape and like, you know, internal bullshit or whatever. And so I said, you know what? In the meantime, let's make this let's make a good series. And so Robert had written, I think, the first well, he worked with Nick Spencer on the first arc. Then they brought in James Asmus for the second arc. Then they brought in Andy Diggle. And by the time Andy came on, it was really just the Andy and me show. And we pretty much, yeah. we were just jamming on that for like three or four arcs, you know. And then, you know, Andy just got busy with other stuff. And then for the final arc, we brought in Brett Lewis, who wrote the very last arc. Okay. Um, yeah, that was just, yeah, that was. And so it was interesting being on this little island. It was like the Kirkman Island, the Kirkman Skybound Island, and watching what was going on with Marvel and DC from afar. So I was just like, you know, whatever yeah. nonsense was going on there. But it was also very interesting watching the whole Walking Dead machine because it just got bigger and bigger over the years. And like going to the San Diego Comic-Con and seeing how like the Walking Dead was just huge. And it was just the merchandise was just huge. And they would rent out the stadium where people would be chased by zombies for like like a couple hundred bucks. But it was, just, it, was, it was just fascinating just sort of getting that front row seat, seeing that. So that was very interesting. 
Well, I love crime comics. I love the series, and I echo uh, what Pete is saying here. He loved Thief of Thieves. Awesome book. <laughs> Missed opportunity for John Hamm to have been Redmond for an adaptation. No, John, Redmond was kind of like an amalgam of John Hamm and myself. That's was kind of. Oh, like that's that. great. Oh, that's. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that, that that's fantastic. Cool. Yeah. That's great. And uh, Christian, uh, obviously, acknowledging that you're an amazing artist. There you go, man. Thanks, Christian. So, oh, very cool. And, you know, Sean, um, much like uh, my good friend, and, and maybe you were friends with him as well, a peer from your time, Judd Winnick, uh, oh. you have lateral to kids' comics. Oh. And once again, we'll peek, we'll peek around the cover. But uh, like lava in my veins, this is uh, this is great. Uh, yeah. Tell me about getting into kids' comics like you're doing right now. Well, this was interesting because, um, you know, I can actually I can, I can hold I can hold the book. Boom. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, well, yeah, there we go. We can see when you do it. There you go, buddy. So, like, so one of the things I learned in, in working in comics is to always diversify. Always diversify because what's going to happen typically when you're a professional working in comics, you're going to hit a dry spell. <clears throat> and usually what happens is, is that you have an editor that you work with and you're, you know, they like your work. And they give you work. And when that editor is gone, it's like you've lost your rabbi. And that's a New York, that's a New York term. Oh no, I'm absolutely yeah. you've lost your rabbi when, when, <laughs> when that editor is gone. So you have to start over. And usually the new editor is like, we have I have my own people that I want to bring in. And <clears throat> so that taught me really early on to sort of always work in different markets, you know. And so the book, the how-to book was the start of that. And so I've always worked in different markets and I had an idea for, well, actually, that was the second, like Lava, hold on. No problem. It was the second book. This was like the first kid's book, Judge Kim. Yeah. So this was something that I developed with uh, Milo Stone, Joe Illage, and, <clears throat> um, excuse me, Christopher Jordan. Now, we're all uh, SVA, School of Visual Arts alumni. Yeah, and um, and so we we've been friends for a long time, and we had this idea. You know, I I had a, had a friend who was a lawyer, and you know, I would always and I, I'm a huge lawyer, television show buff, L.A. Law, Boston Legal, The Practice, all that stuff I love. So I would have this friend who's a lawyer, and I would always say to her, Hey, listen, I heard that if you this happens, this is what you should do. If you get pulled over by the cops, this is what you should do. And she was like, where did you hear that? That's like completely wrong. I'm like, yeah, but the guys, the barbershop said that if you get pulled over by cops, <laughs> you're supposed to clap your hands three times. And she's like, what, what, Sean, really? <laughs> and it really got me thinking how your average person does not know about the law. And I said, you know what? That's an interesting thing to play with. Yeah. And so I got together with the guys and we developed Judge Kim which would be all about teaching kids and their families about the law. And it was really fun. But this is an example of, though, of how sometimes things take time and you need okay. to be patient because we developed this back in 2010. And it took us over the course of maybe 10 years to find a home uh, at Simon Schuster. Wow. You know? and, and over the 10 years, we had people interested in it. At one point, Will Smith was going to do it. Uh, at different points, like, you know, we we had different publishers, different people we had pitched it to. And again, you just learn. This is like, you, you have to realize that if you want to be a creative in this industry, you better get used to rejection. Get used to it. That doesn't mean you have to accept it because, listen, to quote Captain Kirk, I don't believe in the no-win scenario. I just don't believe in it. And, and, and I always think back to that scene, the classic scene from Star Trek Three, where Kirk is in... The, he's in the lounge with with that admiral, with with the, the 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 admiral, and he's trying to convince the admiral. Listen, I need a ship. I need a ship to to go save Spock, and you know I don't need a whole lot. Just give me the ship. And the, and the cat admiral's like, listen, what are you out of your mind? No, you can't go there. It's out of the question. No. And this is this is me as a storyteller. I'm focusing on how this scene is shot because the camera just cuts to William Shatner playing Captain Kirk, and he's just sitting there as the guy's telling him no, and it's like a slow zoom, in and he's just like listening and he goes i hear you i hear you i had to try and that's pretty much my motto it's like whenever you pitch something and someone tells you no it's like okay i'm gonna go this way i'm doing it anyway Absolutely. i'm gonna do it anyway i'm gonna do it anyway <laughs> not tonight but that's not to say that you can't learn from people that tell you no oh because, yeah because i have to say that 
over the 10 years that we developed Judge Kim, we would refine it. We would just make it better and better and better. And actually, and the way these two books kind of are interlinked is that I was approached by uh, Regina, shout out to Regina Brooks at Serendipi Serendipity Lit. Cool. She's a great uh, literary agent. She would approached me about working on like Lava. And she's like, Sean, listen, I'm a fan of your work. <clears throat> and uh, I, one of my clients, Derek Barnes, he's an award-winning author. He's got a really great idea for a children's book. And I think he'd be perfect for it. And I said, you know what? That's interesting. It's different. I wasn't thinking about doing a kid's book, but that's a challenge. It's a storytelling challenge. And it's also a way to diversify and do something different. So I said, sure. Okay, let's do it. And while we were working on that, I said, hey, well, listen, Regina, would you be interested in this other idea that I have? It's about a, a young black girl judge. Oh. And she she read our pitch and she's like, wow, I love that. I love that. I want to represent that. And so while I was working on Like Lava, she was shopping Judge Kim. Wow. So we set up Judge Kim with Simon & Schuster. And then Like Lava is with Penguin Random House. Outstanding. And that's pretty much the way I, I started working on these two kids' books. But I'm working on these while I'm still doing the regular comic book stuff in the background. Yeah. You know, do you and and I haven't read like Lava, but I know Judd uh, in his books has really brought um, a comic book action sensibility. And mm -hmm. I don't know, is are these sequential or are they illustrations yeah. with uh, prose? Like Lava is really a combination. Yeah, yeah, it's a combination of your typical comic book with, you know, um, you know, sometimes they're it spreads, but for the most part, it, yeah, it's, it's really designed like a comic book. Sure. And what was really interesting about this is that Penguin ran the people at Penguin and Nancy Paulson books, shout out to Nancy Paulson. Uh, it's her imprint that we did this for. They had no idea about comics. And so when Derek Barnes and Regina had suggested me, they were like, Sean, we don't know him. He's from comics. We have our own stable of artists that we work with. Sure. Derek really was like, no, this is the guy I want to work with him. And so, you know, and, and with any client, you know, you go in, you introduce yourself, you, 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 you build a, a rapport, you build a relationship. You say, okay, well, this is what you're looking for. And this is how I would go about it. And they really respected my storytelling, you know, um, background and my approach to storytelling. And so for the most part, I pretty much was able to, to apply my way of telling stories to this book, children's book you know, um, arena. And it was great. I mean, like they, they loved, they loved the, the, the final product and it's been great. And it came out uh, the beginning of the month, beginning of July, and it's yeah. really been doing well. I mean, really amazing. They're really, really pushing it. So it's, it's, it's a really, it's a fun project, you know, you know, a really, really great story. I was just at the American Library Association uh, conference here in Chicago, and uh, I've done it every time it comes to the city. And mm -hmm. I do love seeing uh, people like yourself and Derek and, and like I said, Judd, uh, that have, that have, you know, I, and I don't know Derek's background beyond what he's done with you, but it is great to see, I, I see myself blurring much like my background. Uh, uh, it's great. It's great to see uh, you, you guys diversify and get into this realm. And like you said, I think, um, you know, God, as you know, Renee Tel Telgemeier, the, the kids books that really are comics for finally real comics for our kids. And yeah. it's great. And it's we're really uh, building this new generation that are coming in through those things and Captain Underpants. And yeah. um, God, I forget the uh, the superhero, the dog superhero that I had just learned about this year. That mm. is, uh, you know, and I might even be uh, a comic book that Captain Underpants read. And mm. it did so well that they, they developed the series for the dog hero as well. But wow. um, no, it's fascinating. And it's great. I mean. I'm 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 not necessarily going to read them myself, but I I appreciate them, and you know um, I think us classic superhero fans might get frustrated that how are we going to get the kids reading comics? And it's like let the you know Jeff Smith and Bone let the kids read the stuff that is for them, and we'll get people from them, and they'll graduate and still appreciate the comic book aesthetic, and and that's great. And also it only broadens. It doesn't just as you know with Thief of Thieves. It doesn't just and Hellraiser. It doesn't just have to be a superhero world. This storytelling through sequential art is really great. No, and, and it's just educating people to that. No, you're right. I mean, you're and and also the book market is just huge. 
you know, the numbers that that children's books sell, like are are far beyond what comics sell, you know. So yeah. and, and I remember I went to the uh American Library Association when it was here in DC. Sure. What was that? I think that might have been 2019 or 2018 or whatever. I know it was, was recently because I have DC friends that did it as well. So yeah. And yeah, and I remember I was hanging out with Gene Ha. Shout out to Gene Ha, who was an amazing artist. Good Great buddy, absolutely. Guy. And 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 Gene would he was just schooling me. We were just talking about like the numbers that kids' books do. And so I was just like, wow. And so it's interesting having a having a you know a presence there. And also Derek Barnes, who wrote like Lava, this is like his 18th book. He's won multiple awards. He's a New York Times bestseller. And so hey, if we if we can if I can become a New York Times bestseller working with Derek Barnes, that's not a bad thing. I'm with you, man. No, I think it's great. And I, and also, um, the great thing is, um, should you table at an ALA or some show, you can have these uh, diverse books in front of you. And yeah. I mean, that's only something that I appreciated as I got into podcasting and in the 2000s, watching people like Bendis and Rick Remender and others, uh, God, Sanford Green and the various mm -hmm. things that he's done over the years. And it's like, no, that's the smart way to do it, as you say. And really, yeah, man, I mean, you're you're a quadruple thread, if not more, in terms yeah. of things you've done. And, and what's also interesting is that, because I also, because I'm working on a creator-owned book, I've been working on this for a couple of years, and I I, I know that they, I, it's for Abrams books, and John Jennings has an imprint called Megascope. <clears throat> and so I've been working on this printing for a couple of years with them. I know they're, they've been very patient. Um, but it's an amazing, it's a, it's a it's crime noir. It's going to be all black and white uh, with spot red color like Sin City. Um, contemporary set in New York and Paris with a jazz theme. Really excited about it. And uh, I am like more than halfway done. I'm literally two thirds done with this thing. And I'm, I'm bringing, I'm, I'm trying to, you know, wrap it up in the next, you know, couple of months. But I'm really excited about that because, you know, that's something that is just really, because people really respond to my work in black and white. You know, and so for this to be strictly black and white for the most part, with, with like I said, with spot red color, it's really exciting. It's a really exciting project that that I that I, I'm working on. And like I said, I wrote that, and that that's a more adult project. And and then while I'm doing that, then I'm also I also wrote like a, a two part Red Hood story for DC Comics. DC had approached me, um, Ben Abernathy, the, the Batman group editor. Shout out to Ben. Yeah. Ben was like, hey man, listen. Um, I know you're busy working on your 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 creator own book for Abrams, but would you be you know interested in two, in writing a writing and drawing a two part Red Hood story? Because I think they were they needed a placeholder before they're about to jump into their next crossover event, which was Future State. And so he said, "Yeah, I think it could be really great. You know, it'd be crime noir. That's your thing. You know, go to town." I said, "Hey Ben, listen, I'd love to, I'd love to, but I can't draw it because I'm busy working on the Abrams book." Um, but I, I, I'm happy to write something if you're interested in me pitching. So he said, yeah, pitch me something. And so for me, I'm like, okay, this is a really fun opportunity. And I said, well, what could I, what could I do with the red hood? Um, and I said, you know what? I thought about that Hill story that I did with Christopher Priest. Yes. Which was a one shot. And we did that back in 1999. And as far as I know, no one has ever touched the Hill neighborhood again. And so I said, okay, it could be really interesting to kind of go back and make something that you worked on in the past work for you in the present. And so I said, okay, well, let's also, let's look at this. If, if you had a rough neighborhood, what's, what would typically happen to that over a 20 year span gentrification? And so it was a really, so I pitched Ben on what if the Hill now has been gentrified, but there's a new sort of element that's sort of rising there. And he loved it. And so I was able to kind of piggyback on the, the framework of what Christopher Priest did 20 years ago and introduce a whole new hill with new characters. And I was able to play with Jason Todd and sort of plunk him in the middle of this. And so as I've described, that two-parter, that was really structured. I kind of used a Western format when I wrote that, which is the structure of the cowboy rides into town and there's these two warring factions that he gets in the middle of. All right. And so that was the premise for the first for that two part story, which is drawn by Tony Akins. Uh, Stefano. Love Tony. Yeah. Yeah. Tony. Tony is amazing. Tony Akins, Dan Mora did covers. I'd never heard of Dan Mora 
when Ben suggested him. And since then, Dan's like freaking beast. Um, <laughs> and it was, just, and it was great. Like it was a, it was a great two part story. And then last year, you know, um, they were interested in doing me doing a sequel to it. And so now I, I can't, say who the artists are because that's that hasn't been announced yet okay um, but it's a six part s- story and if the first two part story was influenced by like a western structure this is like the wire this six part story is like the wire because it's so it's so sprawling with so many different characters so many different players and i get to play with batman so be able to write original characters that go toe to toe with not only batman but bruce wayne and Jason Todd has been really fun. So we're just about done with the art. We have five pages left for the artwork and uh, then it's going to be colored. And then hopefully we can, you know, DC can schedule it. So I'm really excited. Outstanding. About that. And the Abrams project too. Um, God, you know, I, and you're an old Hollywood fan. Um, mm-hmm. Do you know this movie? I, uh, not, it was Paul Newman and Sidney Poitier in Paris and it's from the mid sixties and they're yeah. jazz guys. No, it's, no, no. I, oh, I can't think of the damn name of it right now. We got to uh, IMDb it. But um, I, I happen to catch it a couple of times, and it's it's a really cool movie, and I, I had never heard of it. And I, I love I love jazz. I love – I mean, Around Midnight is one of my favorite uh, mm. films from the 80s, mm. you know, with Dexter Gordon and everything and okay. in Paris. Uh, I No, I, I – you know, I got, I got the opportunity to interview Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Oh, and, wow. Uh, yeah, and uh, he was doing um, – Mike Roft Holmes, uh, both he did a novel and then he did a graphic novel. Okay. And in setting it up, his PR people are like, well, what do you want to talk about? I'm like, he read comics when he was a kid. I, I'm like, I know he gets bored talking basketball. I want to talk about his love for comics. And I said, I'm an amateur be- jazz buff. He's an expert. I want his uh, recommendations. And they're like, that's great. He's going to love this. And he could not have been sweeter and so generous with his time. And his, I mean, he was enthusiastic talking. And again, coming from sports radio, all my buddies that have interviewed him a million times, like he gets really bored talking sports. He gets really bored talking airplane and even doing uh, 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 Ring of Death or what it was, the Bruce Lee movie, you know, and hanging with Chuck Norris. And I'm like, don't worry, I'm not going to talk to him about that. So he was was in the jazz. He was in the jazz. Yeah, he was. Oh, yeah, he was absolutely. You know, now he it's so sad. He had a massive fire in his house and had this incredible jazz record collection oh. and it all went away. It was so sad. But, you know, he picked up and is, you know, still a bit big buff. And, you know, I wanted recommendations of modern jazz people and he was ready. You know, here's, here's the thing about me and jazz. I actually love jazz music, but I like I like the I like the sensation of listening to jazz. But I couldn't tell you who, who did what. I couldn't. I couldn't name albums like that. Like I love going to like like a, a jazz club and just sitting there and watching the musicians play instruments and and just just you know riffing and just you know be bouncing back and forth. I love that energy of it. That's really why I love it. And that's why for the Abrams book because that project is called The Heavy. Um, and I, you know it's always interesting trying to nail down what you want to talk about, what themes you want to play with. And so I thought that so I use jazz as the backdrop there. And so there's a, it's a lot. There's a very it's a lot of music. It's a very thick jazz element to that story. And um, I was so fortunate because I was with um, uh, my my uh, my ex girlfriend um, at a in, in Paris last year, and you know she really because well, I was I was actually invited to. Uh, be a judge at an art competition in um, London. And she was like, well, you know, we're in London and your part of your story is set in Paris. So why don't we just jump over to Paris for like two days and you can literally shoot reference for what you're going to use in the story. And it was such a great suggestion and we had a really great time, um, you know, uh, doing it. So we literally went to Paris and I had these, these, um, neighborhoods that I had written down that I was also I was totally prepared to do a Google map search and you know just sort of like get reference that way. But we literally went to these neighborhoods and I shot so much reference in Paris that I'm now up to that part of the story now where like they're they're in Paris because it starts in New York, goes to Paris, then comes back to New York. Okay. And so it's just been a really it's just so much fun. And actually then the great thing about it, that project the heavy is that I'm working with John Workman, who oh, is, great. Uh, for those of you who don't know, John is a legendary letterer. 
you know, he had worked with Walt Simons and all of that Thor stuff. That's John Workman. And to have John Workman letter a script that I wrote on artwork that I drew, it's just, I, I just have to pinch myself. And he's the sweetest guy. And whenever I, I'll sit in pages, he's just so complimentary and he's so, you know, so gracious. And like, like last night, he just sent like a, a new spread that he had lettered. And I'm just like, like John, this is gorgeous. And so it's amazing to, to, to be working with people whose work that you grew up on. You know, that's the really cool thing about this industry is that you start off as a fan. And then when you get into the industry, you're actually in a weird way, you're contemporaries now, like you're, they're your peers. You know what I mean? And you I'm do. just like, John, I, I, I'm like, John, you know, I, 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 I'm, you're making me want to cry here with some of these emails that he writes me about how complimentary is about my work. And it's just like, That's oh my great. God, like, you gotta be kidding me. So it's a rush. It's really amazing to work with, you know, such talented people and people that you grew up loving, you know? I, I do know, man, you know, again, uh, 30 years in Chicago broadcasting and I recorded an interview with, I don't know if you the, know the horror TV host, Sven no. but we were talking and he's a, uh, he's national now he's on me TV. Uh, mm -hmm. on Saturday night showing, you know, just like uh, Gulari was uh, back in the day, or I don't know who your uh, New York or DC horror hosts were, but it was the same thing in terms of there's a guy that, I mean, he's, you know, got a, a decade and a half of on me, but uh, I grew up watching him and now he considers me a contemporary. So I, I know, I know that vibe and jazz, that music lends itself to noir. I mean, you mm -hmm. hear Harlem Nocturne or something like that. And immediately, metaphorically, you're in the trench coat, you're smoking the cigarette, you're sitting at the bar and everything. Uh, yeah. You know, I don't know if you know, uh, you know, Jack Webb beyond Dragnet did a yeah. show called Pete Kelly's Blues and a movie mm -hmm. as well. And mm -hmm. it's 20s jazz. Uh, so it's more Dixieland. But he still had that Joe Friday delivery. And uh, he was a, a trumpet player that found himself in kind of noir situations. They only made wow. one season of it, but it's it's a great radio show. Yeah. And it, you know, and also Pat Novak for hire. He was a San okay. Francisco detective in that. This is all pre -drag dragnet stuff that he made. And yeah, no, I, I absolutely get it. Uh, I want to put up a, a comment from uh, Christian, who uh, must be excited that you're uh, coming back to the Hill because he oh. says he loved loved your work on Detective and the Hill, the, Thanks, the original Christian. one. And if you didn't see it earlier, Tomb Raider also says can't wait for Sean's uh, Red Hood comic. So that's good, man. We're uh, we're letting the audience know of. Uh, fun adult stuff that you're doing as well as the great kids comics. So that's yeah, wonderful. Yeah. yeah. It's really, it's, and it's really a matter of like bouncing back and forth between projects that I'm writing and drawing. And so another project I'm very excited about is uh, I have a creator on series for an image that's, that's, that's coming out and this I'm writing this one and I'm working with an amazing, an amazing Italian artist um, who I have to give a shout out to my guy, Alessio Dinesse, who is Dinesse, who is a very talented editor over uh, in Rome. And I met him when I was working on Thief of Thieves and he was handling the Italian adaptation. Of sure. Thief of Thieves. And so they brought me to Rome, uh, the, to the Romix Con. And I actually won an award and hung with Alessio and such a great guy. And um, Alessio connected me with this, this amazing artist and who I'm not going to mention yet because it's, it's a surprise, but um, okay. his stuff is just simply amazing. And so it's a, we, we, uh, it's a six part series for Image. And uh, yeah, like we're the stuff he's been doing is just uh, just gorgeous. So and that's sci-fi. So that's me. Oh wow! Playing the, that's me playing in the sci-fi realm, which is really really fun. Yeah. Excellent, man. All right, before we wrap up, because you made the the Star Trek two reference, uh, um, are you watching any of the new Star Trek product? You know what? I have to say, I was really behind my my buddy Mike. Shout out to Mike, Mike Eubanks. Mike was on me, Sean. Do you watch Picard? Watch Picard. Watch Picard. And I, I and there's, then there's so much stuff on TV. It's hard to keep up with this stuff. So I finally said, all right, let me break down and watch Picard. All right. The first two seasons were cool. They were well, cool. They were, they were cool. cool. They were cool. They were cool. There were, there were some. There were some uneven parts there. There was some even the uneven, uneven things. Some things drag a little bit. But season three. Season three, I'm like, okay, whoa, whoa. Yeah. So, yeah, so that's the most recent Star Wars thing. And now Mike is like, Sean, you got to watch Strange New Worlds. You got to you gotta get up on that. So it's on the list, but okay. I still got to get through. <laughs> I'm trying to finish up Jack Ryan. 
because because I, I, I like that whole spy stuff. Cool. And then Justified just came back, so I got to cut yes. up those, those two episodes. So sure. Love Raylan. Love, love, love Raylan. Love Justice. Oh, yeah. Um, and yeah, and there's just some other stuff I got to keep up, but there's just so much stuff that just drops. It's just hard to keep up. I so hear you, man. I I still haven't started The Expanse, and everyone I know raves about how great six seasons of The Expanse are. And you know I, what? And, you know. I, I've been giving shout-outs to everybody, but, but since you mentioned The Expanse, Shout out to Andy Diggle, my former partner in crime, writer extraordinaire. <clears throat> Andy has been raving about The Expanse for freaking years. And he's just like, it's the greatest thing. And I'm like, okay, I know it's on the list. It's on the list. And he actually is working on an Expanse comic book for, what is it, um, Boom? I want to say, uh, yeah, I was going to say Boom, yeah. yeah. I think Boom. So yeah. I, that's like a, I know that's a dream come true for him. You know, and, and Andy lives in the UK. So, like, you know, he's just... But but yeah, I I it's I know everyone raves about that. Andy's raved about it enough, so I, it's on the list to check out. I hear you, man. And no, you're right. I mean, that's one of the positives that comes out of this the writers and actors strike is all right now with you know less content coming out likely in the months ahead. Uh, there's uh, an opportunity to catch up on things. Did you watch the Diplomat on um, Netflix? It's on the list. It, okay, it's, on the, it's great. It's, it's on the list, you know. It's I. I tried to watch Citadel. Sure. Um, yeah. Would you? Th you know. Yeah. That's honestly, Sean. That's how I felt too. And I like the Russos. I really like the Russos. I like the Russo. I like the Russos. But you know, there's so much. Here's this is the way I watch TV. I give you one episode. I because because if you don't hook me in that first episode, I got to move on. Yeah. I got to move on. Yeah. And I think I gave you two episodes with that Citadel, and I was just like, eh, not enough. Not enough. So, but but yes, the diplomat. I've heard good things. That's on the list. Um, what was what, I, what was I watching? <laughs> well, I just finished up Mayans because I because I was a big Sons of Anarchy guy. So that just wrapped up on FX. So like I'm done with yeah. that. Um, yeah, I just you know I just I just bounce around. There's just too much stuff to keep up with. This is too much. You know? I so hear you, man. Uh, yeah. Sean, this has been great. Truly, I'm I'm really glad we finally had the opportunity to talk. And given what's coming up, expect an email because I'll be bugging you about a lot of this stuff. The Hill sequel and what you're doing, the, the jazz thing with Abrams and everything sounds great. All this yeah. stuff is really, really cool. And we'll remind everyone, I've got the one cover, but, uh, you know, there's uh, Like Lava in My Veins. Yes, mm -hmm. indeed. And, uh, yeah, uh, so uh, a good opportunity for uh, if the kid in your life to uh, pick that up. And I, I trust your... Uh, I, I trust your, you know, your your faith in your collaborator, man. And, and indeed, Judge exactly, uh, uh, Judge Kim and the kids' court. Very, yes. very cool. Basically, this is this is like the Little Rascals meets Judge Judy. <laughs> That's the pitch. That's the pitch right there. Outstanding. Well, seriously, man, a, a real pleasure talking to you and, and getting the opportunity. And John, uh, all the best. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Please come back, man. Yeah, absolutely. No, we'll uh, we'll certainly do more. Everybody, thanks a lot for watching. I'm off to Terrificon. Um, I've nice. got a, I've got an interview with Svanguli that's coming up this week, and I'm going to do my best to at least get uh, at least one or two of the panels at Terrificon because I'm taking my laptop with me. So after I record them, I'll try and throw them up at least on the audio side. So hopefully, people will check them out. Until next time, everybody, stay safe, stay happy, stay help, stay healthy. Mm -hmm.